All right. And we are live. Give it a minute. Awesome. Okay, and we are live and direct. Welcome everyone. We are on ED Colonize class number four, cuatro. And to begin tonight, I am so excited. We have a hot topic. We have an amazing guest that's joining us tonight. But as always, let me just begin with our general introduction. All right. Okay, so for tonight, ED Colonize, uh, class number four, we have a very special guest. His name is Huitzilolot Anahuac. I'm going to get more into um, a little bit more of who he is and what he's, what he's going to be doing for us tonight. It's going to be very, very important conversation. So we're going to be talking about DNA results. We're going to be talking about as displaced indigenous people, you know, what are some of the tools that he can offer us? What are some of the problematic mm -hmm. aspects of this? What are the pros and cons? So there is so much to unpack because it's a special edition. The class is going to be longer. So feel free, you know, you won't hurt our feelings if you have to leave by the hour. Uh, we're really excited and we want to make sure that we maximize this. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, at the end of the talk that he gives tonight, we are going to be able to take uh, questions and hopefully provide some nice and ins insightful uh, answers for you. So as usual, just to let you know, this is my course, E Decolonize. I want this to be a safe space. For everyone, I want people to feel welcomed. This is for all ages. You know, I'm really excited. We get families that message me saying that, you know, that they sit with their teenage kids. I get families with their moms. So we want to be very mindful of how we interact with each other. So absolutely no hate speech, no anti-LGBTQ, no anti-Black, no any of that. This There's a lot of places where people can do that. I'm not going to allow this platform to be used for that. I want you to feel safe. I want this to be an hour, an hour and a half for you to take, you know, take a sit, uh, sit back and enjoy, discuss. There's so much to unpack. And as always, if you would like to contribute to the efforts that I'm doing, um, I have three donation pages. This is absolutely free. But if you want to support my work and what I do, I have Zelle, Cash App, and Venmo, which is also on the links. And also at the end of this talk, I will be providing you with a Google Doc, which is already found on the form here. If you can please provide me your feedback, it's really helpful for us to see what's working, you know, what, what you liked, what you learned, what questions that you may have, and to just make it better, right? To make it a more, um, a more human connection and I get to know you as well. So thank you very much for joining me tonight. Um, I also wanted to let you know that next Friday, class number five, we are gonna be talking about the Nahuatl language and the importance of language revitalization. So I just wanted to give you the heads up right now. Then it's gonna be with special guest Quitlawak Martinez. He is a Nahuatl teacher. So be looking forward. I am looking forward to having him next Friday. So without further ado, we wanna get into it. So brother Huitzilolot, a Nahuatl, he is someone that I've met, oh my goodness, going on 12 years now. <laughs> With the Yolot, I yeah. met him, right? I, I met you when uh, we were yes. doing protest for uh, Arizona. Oh. We were getting ready to protest Arpaio and the racist uh, laws of Arizona. Back in 2008, I met him at ELAC when we were preparing for those protests. And ever since, you know, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of admiration for you. You are, you have a bachelor's and master's in Chicano studies. Is that correct? Yes. And then yeah. now you're also a body worker. So he also went through to school for that. And not only that, he's also a community activist. He's a writer, poet. He's a mentor to a lot of youth, especially from Santa Ana. Shout out to Santa Ana tonight. 
And right now he's currently on a little break. So we have a, a, we're very, very grateful to have him. He's actually going to school to get his credential in special education. He works, you know, his biggest passion from what I have seen is working with special education uh, kids. And he is such a passionate, such a, a down to earth, you know, mentor who has helped transform a lot of lives. So, you know, and besides all Thank that, you. <laughs> Besides all that, Witiolo, you have a particular interest in DNA and establishing and creating our indigenous family tree. So without further yes. ado, please, I do want people to be able to leave their questions. So at the end of our talk, I'll be able to address some of those. So yeah, without further ado, I'm going to close my, my slide and you can go ahead and open yours. So. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Oh, wait, I need to share it. So for everyone listening, I'm seeing your comments. I'll be able to moderate the questions at the end. It's going to be really exciting. And we have about an hour and a half tonight. So I am very excited. Okay, can you see it? Yes, now I can see it. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Witiolo, and I am... I'm sharing just my journey on DNA tests and how to, you know, interpret it, how to read them, and how to use that to reconnect to your, to our indigenous roots. So my, so my topic is called decolonizing DNA results. <clears throat> okay, so what is, what is DNA? Uh, DNA, which stands for uh, <clears throat> deoxy rubio nucleic acid, is a molecule of groups of atoms stuck together that shape like a double helix. Uh, DNA is hereditary material in humans, which, de which determines characteristics of all living organisms. So basically it just makes us who we are. So we have 3 billion cells and, and our DNA tells them what to do. Uh, so again, DNA is amino acids. It, it builds proteins to form you know, organs, muscles, bones, basically again, to create who we are. How does a DNA test determine our ethnicities? Um, so there is a reference panel that the DNA companies have collected uh, who have a long history in one, in one or one of 20 global regions. So some of the DNA companies have over 70,000 genotype markers to reference your, to, to reference your genetics. Uh, each marker has a different frequency and a different population. So that means, so for example, if you know, some popu some different populations might have the same um, DNA, but one particular group might have it more. So that so that's what they're so they're also looking at at that too on um, what DNA appears more in certain groups. So the pros and cons of taking a DNA test. So the pros are you learn about your ethnic background. Um, it helps you in, it helps you prevent diseases. The results can ease anxieties about health. Um, you could also be reconnected to lost family members. Uh, it could tell you about your life, like healthy lifestyle that you could that you could you know change and tailor. Um, you can find out really cool facts about your body and your genes, and you discover what traits parents pass down to you. So for me, I took 23andMe, um, and that one has the health component, like your genes and your genetics, and um, so stuff like that. And then it and it has your maternal and paternal. So I'll go over that some more. So I looked up like the top DNA test testing companies. So number one is CRE Genetics. I actually never heard of them, but they're privately owned. And what makes them, I guess, number one is that they have the top renowned geneticists um, that's working with them. And so they also have the maternal, and so the MT DNA and the Y DNA, that's the maternal and paternal online, but it's not always available. Uh, 23andMe is the most accurate and more detailed, I guess, in terms of percentages. Um, again, it has the maternal line and the Y DNA, y DNA and has many, health health, has many health reports available. The Ancestry one, Ancestry DNA, is, um, that, the benefit of that one is it has a large database of um, documents. So you could look up birth certificates, you could look up um, census records, so you're able to kind of like build to research your family tree like th through documents. 
if you don't have if you don't if you just want to look at the ancestry website without taking the test i think you have to pay a, a monthly a monthly fee to to look into that I, i'm not sure if it's I, I i'm assuming it's free if you took the dna test for that company so the cons of taking the dna test um, so there are psychological implications so that could mean uh, maybe you take a DNA test and you weren't prepared to find out that maybe your dad wasn't your dad, or maybe your mom used an egg donor to have you, or just certain things like that, where maybe someone will switch that birth in your family, <clears throat> just different things um, that could happen. Uh, I found some interesting facts about my family, um, like affairs were happening and certain people weren't, um, like, like, I have a, on my mom's side, like her my grandma's sister, like one of them wasn't the, her dad wasn't the, the dad of one of her siblings. So just the stuff like that, that you might find. Um, I know it's more impactful when it's your parents, when you think, you know, when you think someone's your parent or not. So again, that's kind of, um, you know, to kind of prepare yourself for, for just for those kind of surprises. Uh, again, another con is there's no counseling, right? For dealing with, for dealing with those results. So, something you could discover something tragic and you don't have a way to how to deal with that and the, so the companies don't don't offer that kind of support um dna tests are not 100 percent reliable and again people have issues with like privacies or concerns um, some companies will sell your dna uh, some companies are linked to ph pharmaceuticals so again just do your research on on um on what you feel comfortable with with the DNA companies. So, oh, so DNA results. So, um, all right. So, I'm sorry. So, before we continue, that was basically a general introduction, right, to DNA yes. services and all that. So, um, from what I remember, I, you took a DNA test years ago, right? Yes. So, and then this came on. So this is going to be really exciting for everyone that's um, watching right now. He is sharing a very personal <laughs> thing here. So I want to, you know, yes. give you um, acknowledge that and um, take us through your journey, right? Of what did this mean to you? Um, what questions did you have? I mean, this is this is really really interesting. And again, I do um, I really respect the fact that you are sharing this in a public manner. So, Dasa uh, Komati yeah. for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I took this maybe 2013, and actually a friend bought it for me. So it was kind of like a like a gift and. Um, at that point, I already had a strong foundation of being indigenous, and I was proud of that, and that's what I claimed. And so, you know, I wasn't going to let the results, you know, affect my identity. And again, there's kind of this anxiety of when you take the test, especially if you like, if you know you're indigenous and you know, and you might, there's a, there's a fear of you might be more Spanish or um, something else might pop up. So it's kind of like, it's kind of, scary or nerve wracking like because you don't because we, we don't because we know who we are but then to see like the percentages is kind of like a whole other thing and so crazy so funny enough that the, the my results have, have have always um they've been changing so for example it says i'm 40 45 percent um it was actually like lower and then it kind of i guess with new um information on our dna it kind of it, it just updates information so um so yeah, so I'm, and I, I'm sorry, be, sorry, sorry to, for the people that don't okay. know how to do this. Sorry. <laughs> Can okay. you take us to the physical part? What, what is entailed in this whole process? I mean, before you get your results, what do you have to do physically? What does that look like as far as the spit, the saliva? Is it a stick? Is it a jar? Um, how long did yeah. it take you to get the results? Just, you know, general stuff like that, please. Okay, so you go on the line, you go on the website um, for for this for this example, 23andMe, and you order a kit. You sign up, like you use like a code. You create your own account, and then um, so you order you order the kit. It sends it sends it to your house. It's basically a tube, like a little tube, like this big, and you just kind of like you just spit. It has it tells you like where like how far how much spit they want, and then you just send it in. And I don't know, I guess a couple of weeks, maybe a month. 
um, you get an email saying that your results have came in. So then you, you sign up and then you have your DNA results. <laughs> and um, so like, yeah. Um, it, so yeah, so just even with that, um, so again, like being like, you know, you know, like almost half, you know, indigenous, it wasn't really surprising. It wasn't like shocking. Um, I was hoping I was more, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. And, um, you know, again, there's, there's this, um, there's like these debates online about, oh, like we're not, we didn't come from Asia, we're not African, we came from, you know, this continent. And, you know, again, science says that humanity, humanity came from Africa and then people migrated to Asia and then it dis then people dispersed all across, across the world over millions of years ago. So again, the genes mutate, um, you know, you might have, so it's, it gets tricky because then you have like racist white people saying, oh, well, you're not really indigenous because you, you come from eight, like you come from Asia. And um, again, like that was like millions of years ago, but you know, our culture, our identity was born on this continent. And, you know, so it doesn't matter if, if our human migration started from somewhere else. It doesn't mean that we're directly African, we're directly um, Asian. So as, as you can see my results right here, um, when you see Chinese and South Asian, and it kind of gives you a little a bit of more detail, like I'm barely any Asian. Um, and when, for some, I guess for some reason, they did, they kind of combine Asian and Native American, but when Asians take the test, it will say like, it will say like Chinese, like it's more detailed to them uh, because they're more Asian, right? So I don't have any Asian DNA. So I'm, or maybe barely 1%, but again, cause maybe I might have some DNA with, related to Asia, but again, that doesn't make me Asian, okay? And then, um, all right, so again, you know, it's kind of like sometimes when um, when you like for me, I'm get like so I'm gonna be honest, I'm I'm against um, like when I have children, I don't I don't want to have I want my kids to be brown, to be indigenous, to be like I'm like I'm against interracial like mixing or whatever. And as you just, and people might think, oh well, that sounds purist and it sounds like whatever, but again, I'm not pure, like, I'm not pure myself, I'm mixed already, so when I have children with other races, my DNA, my indigenous DNA goes down, and I have family members who have been, who have children with white people, and their kids look white already, right, so we're, like, literally a generation away from being wiped out, at least physically, like, we might not look brown, brown anymore, or indigenous anymore so again like seeing this is kind of like it kind of makes me want to be it makes me want to preserve my I guess my indigenous identity even more because how because because I'm already half right so I mean I don't even though I don't have a white parent I still have you know white genes because again of, of like our people went through a massive rape and um you know so again like it, I might not have a this a distinct you know, ancestor that's white, but it's still, it's still there. Um, okay, so that's my native, my native DNA. And then, my, so the next one is my, year, so the European line. Um, I think it's, I can't see because you kind of cut off, I think it's 25%, right? It says 28.2%. 28%. Okay, so again, most of that comes from Southern European. So again, it's Spanish, uh, Portuguese, I guess it kind of like links the like Southern Europeans together. And, you know, I might have like a little, barely any Jew, Jewish, um, barely any like Northern, like British um, DNA. So again, that kind of correlates to, you know, like how our people have been like raped. And, you know, so I'm not, so I'm not, so again, I want to encourage you guys to not be defined by this. Um, do not let this like discourage you. And maybe you have it higher um, or whatever, but again, don't let that like, Take, don't let that like discourage you from claiming to be indigenous because our European blood is really irrelevant at this point. I mean, unless you're like 100% Spanish, but if you're not, then don't don't take this like to heart. I mean, it's there. We could acknowledge it. We could, you know, just say yeah, like we have European blood, but whatever <laughs> at this point. And again, we have to understand the historical um, implications of this. Again, most of humanity has been colonized, they have been raped, they have had a genocide, 
but many people, many cultures around the world stay true to them to themselves. Even the Spaniards themselves, the Spaniards um, had you know Arab blood and and different. I mean that area of that Southern Europe has been colonized by groups of people, and the Arabs had a more um, impact in on in Spain uh, in terms of like language and culture and even um, their blood. So even again, the Spaniards themselves were had already had you know a mixture of maybe Arab maybe some Arab blood, but even them, they were like, no, we're not Arab and we're Spanish. And so people say true to who they are, but I know our people are, are like, we have this, I don't know, like this anguish of like being um, Spanish and like being like, oh yeah, like, you know, I, I have a, a grandparent that was white or whatever, Spanish or had blue eyes. And, and um, you know, and so I also, I also talk about like this DNA test that I saw and it was a Mexican family and, the family knew exactly who they were. Like they, like I guess their language. I guess someone spoke an indigenous language, and they know it. They, they knew the language, and and um, so I, so they were they were more indigenous. But then the mom kind of she kept repeating like at least three times that oh yeah, but we have Spanish blood. Oh like my grandpa had blue eyes, or someone was Spanish. So it was always this, this like reminder of like well we're Spanish too, and um, like again like you know, we're not, we're not, we're not defined by that. Like even with black Americans, like they don't identify with just the English, you know, blood. Um, like, yeah, I'm just black. Right. So, but yeah, we have this like anguish that we can't shake off. Like we have to like, like we say, Oh, well, we can't deny our Spanish blood. We can't, you know, we're not full. We're not, we're not um, full blood. So how can we not, you know, accept, like, how can we not deny our Spanish blood? Right. So again, just, when you understand history, when you, when you understand what the Spaniards did to our people, it, it makes it more easier for us to not to not claim it because again, it was a violation, it was an invasion, it was a rape. So it's like, how do you like, define? How do you identify with that kind of um, with that? Okay, so next, so my um, African roots is ten percent. And so when I first when I first saw this, I was kind of like, well, that's kind of pretty high. I wasn't really surprised, but um, like again, like most Mexicans that like that have that that I know or that I've seen that have taken this test, they're like either none or like two, three percent. So I was kind of like, okay, then again, I didn't know where this came from. Um, I never heard of African ancestry in my family. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, I thought maybe it just came from maybe generations of, you know, African people in Mexico and it kind of just got, got absorbed in or um, so, you know, like, like I have a friend, I think she's watching. So she's from Costa Chica. She's from Guerrero and they're known for like high concentration of um, Afro Mexicans. And what's interesting about them is that even though they have, I mean, so some of them, are very culturally indigenous. They speak their indigenous language. Um, and so, you know, I still consider them indigenous, but again, some of them might consider some, some of them might identify as black because of discrimination or how they look or, 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 or what they go through in Mexico. And, uh, but they're very interesting because they look very, um, like if you compare them to black Americans, they look completely different because, I, because the people in Mexico have more like native indigenous blood while black people in the u.s have more like like european and black mixture so i, I got a friend she took this test and she was like 50 percent native american 30 percent african and eight percent spanish which is kind of like which is kind of cool because she had like very little Sp spanish blood but um so i never thought i was going to find out where this came from but it turns out i i did like the research and so another so i'm going to go over this later but the, the benefit of this test 23 means that you get linked up to other family members. And um, so I found one family who, who kind of contacted me and um, she goes, she goes, okay, she goes, yeah, I have an aunt, she's 90, 98 years old. And she knows, I, th I think she knows like a lot of history. And then, so when I, when I was talking to her, she says, some, she said, um, she mentioned like a comment. So I have, so my mother's dad, so my, my great grandpa Patricio on my mom's side, um, this lady told me, oh, I heard he's black, half black. Is that true? And I was like, 
I have no idea. I was like, you know what? I don't know because I thought he, you know, I've seen pictures of him and he and he doesn't look black. So I thought maybe it was the mother, not him. And um, and then the more research we did, like that that picture wasn't him. It was his brother. So again, it's kind of like, you know, going back to. So I'm, I was kind of surprised that it was a like it was the my African root was was very kind of an it was a distant not distant it was a a very close um, ancestry. So this lady told me this fascinating story of my great grandpa's mother. Um, she was from Coahuila, and she was sold off to for marriage. So this white man, this Spaniard, he bought her for marriage and so again so again you see even so let's say let's say that guy was Spaniard again you start seeing like like he bought her like he you know he bought her for marriage it wasn't like this love story it was like I'm gonna buy you and marry you and uh, so I'm assuming so she was indigenous my great grandmother great grandmother who her name was Margarita and apparently she had an affair with a black a black man and had my great grandpa Patricio and I was like, that's interesting. So let me look up Coahuila. So I looked up Coahuila and it turns out there was the there was this um, these black so these so black people escaped slavery from the US and they ended up in Coahuila. So that's how that happened. So I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. Like I, I had no idea. Like I wouldn't have never thought that if I had African roots, it would have been through like the US experience more. I thought it was more like the Mexican experience. So I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, again, I don't like, and again, when you look at DNA test results, a lot of people get excited that they're like 2% African. Like you see George Lopez and you see other people saying, oh, I'm 2% black and they get really excited. And I could, and it's kind of like, but yeah, they don't really care for their indigenous side. And again, I could understand like, yeah, like black culture seems, if, you know, in the US it's very cool. And it's like, like people, a lot of people emulate black culture in the US. So like for me, I mean, I'm proud to have this. Um, I don't like identify as black. Um, I don't, people, people don't recognize me as black. They don't, my, like, my experience is not black. So I'm not gonna like sit there and be like, okay, well I, I could claim black now because I'm, I'm black, right? And then, um, so my mom took the test too. And so she, what really shocked me more, um, well, her whole, res, her whole results were shocking because I thought she was more European, but she actually has less European than I do. Um, she's more, she's indigenous. She's, uh, she's obviously more indigenous, but then her African side was 17%. So I was like, wow, that's, that's even more shocking because my mom doesn't come off as African. Like she does not look black at all either. So, um, so it's really interesting how like DNA works and how like features come up and what people look like. Um, so, I, so I think I was interested in just kind of like finding out where this came from because I was like, I must have a com like a recent ancestor, and so I find out that it was from you know an ex person, an ex slave who was esca who escaped to, you know to, into Mexico. And I, when you think about African roots in Mexico, you think of like the southern part, like Guerrero and Acapulco and Oaxaca, but you don't think about uh, the northern part, even though it makes sense because again we're right next to the U.S. Um, Coahuila is borderline border Texas, so it kind of makes sense too. But you don't you're we more inclined to think like this like southern Mexico when we think about the African root. <clears throat> so that's that. <laughs> and then so again, this is uh, um Western Asian North unassigned. Um so this actually went up before I had like I had like zero. I didn't have any Arab, but now it's like three percent, three point five, um North African, northern West Asian, and that's like that's like the Middle East. And again, if you know, again, that maybe came from the Arabs conquering Spain, right? So, um, so there's that. And then what's another thing that's interesting about this is the unassigned DNA. So I have 11%, which basically they don't know where it's from. They don't have, maybe, the, maybe they can't pinpoint it. They don't have the genetic markers for it yet. Um, so they don't know where it comes from, right? But What's interesting is that I've noticed, um, so when, I, when you look at um, Mexican, Central American DNA, there's a lot of, um, 
unassigned DNA. But when you look at when you look at African like Black people, Africans, Asians, and Europeans, they don't they most likely they don't have unassigned DNA. And so my theory my theory is that you know this unassigned DNA is the indigenous DNA. And I so again when you look at when you understand history, you understand that. Our people were wiped out. We were, you know, annihilated. Um, we had a genocide, a Holocaust. So there's DNA that we lost. So we, so we can't trace it. We don't know where it comes from. So we might still, we might still have this DNA, um, <clears throat> but we don't. But again, because it wasn't by the time I guess science started recording DNA, um, that DNA was already lost, right? So, so that's my, th- so that's my brother, theory. I don't know where. So I don't know. If, Yes. Sorry. So real quick. So the unassigned portion of a DNA result from what you're saying, it looks like the majority people of color are the ones that usually get this reported, which what you're saying and what you're calculating is that that could be um, indigenous populations that have either been, you know, completely killed off or haven't been collected. And you're saying that this, what you're seeing, I think this is very interesting because you're uh, from what the conversations we've had, you shared that most, most of the time that you see this, it's on a person of colors, right? DNA. You're not, you're not, we don't see well, this on, on white or how is that? Well, um, I've only seen this with Mexicans and Central Americans and maybe South Americans, but I, I, I haven't seen a lot of South American DNA, but I've seen Central Americans like Salvadorians, Guatemalans and Mexicans that have unassigned DNA. Um, a lot of black people, they don't have, they don't have unassigned DNA and, and the whites and Asians don't, don't have unassigned. If, it, if they have it, it's like maybe barely 1%, but it's not as high as a lot of Mexicans and Central Americans that I've seen. Got it, thank you. <laughs> yes, so, so yeah, so this is again, um, so again, we don't know. I mean, it could be that they can't, they, they, they don't know where it's at they, they, like because again not not every human has been tested for you know has been their DNA has not been collected but it's well but when you see like a commonality of like Mexicans and Central Americans and when you don't again because black you know like black people they weren't they weren't destroyed necessarily they're more like they're more enslaved and sent all over the world and Asians you know again they don't they weren't really um, colonized and they didn't have a genocide per se. And again, like the Europeans, they didn't, you know, they didn't have that either. So, um, so when you see, th- so when, so again, it makes sense to me that all this unassigned DNA has to be some like ancient, you know, indigenous DNA that ha- wasn't that wasn't recorded by the time I guess science kind of figured this out. Okay, so then, so maternal line. So this is kind of this is very interesting because um, maternal line is what it's it's a female line that mothers pass on to their daughters. So it so it's a Hollywood group or genes that are passed down to mothers and daughters. So as men, we kind of have X and Y um, DNA, and women only have the X chromosome, which is like the female line, um, and so, so men, again, like if you're going through biology, like men have sperm and when sperm and egg come together, um, men determine, men, the men's sperm determine the sex of the child. So women only carry XX, men carry XY. So if a man sends an X, um, X DNA and then the woman has the X, that, that, that's going to be a girl. If if the man has the Y, and again, women only have the X, so that's a boy. So, um, so that's how that happens. So, so mine, um, Halio group is B2, and B2 is most common in the Native American groups in the Southwest. So, that could be Navajo, Zuni, Siri, different groups like that. <clears throat> What's interesting enough is like through family research or just history, um, my grandma always told my mom that her mother was from the Southwest, um, New Mexico. Um, so I guess, again, even if let's say around that, let's say she was from Mexico, it's, it's still in that general area, the Southwest. 
So that's where our DNA, that's, that's like the, the most native populations that have that DNA, um, B2. Um, again, there's a lot of historical migration that happens with our people. So, it, so it's evident in which in where who shares similar genetics with, the, with other indigenous groups throughout the continent. So again, when you see like, the, for example, the Mexica and the Scala and other groups of in Mexico claim that they came from the north and the north meaning the U.S. And when you start seeing, um, so this one, this is like the, so I guess this group of people is called the Anazanzi, which is again, the Southwest. And they were in that area in the eighth century. But you see other groups that were um, like the, the, the mountain builders from like, I think they're from Ohio, Mississippi area. And then you see, um, so, you, so you start seeing these groups of people, their civilizations are kind of crumbling. So you start seeing, so they're migrating down south and then they end up in the southwest, four corners, um, the seven caves as well. What, 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 what we hear in like Chicano studies, like the seven caves. And then from the, so then there are seven groups that met in that area and then they all dispersed down into Mexico, which is the Mexica, the Scala, and other groups of people that that um that came from the north so again our people have been migrating for you know thousands of years and and we're all over the place so it kind of makes sense that even though let's say i didn't let's say all my, let's say if i knew all my, my family was from mexico and i and you know they weren't from the u.s or any, anywhere it makes sense that there's still like a dna um pattern that you that you start like my my genes or my how you group are in other parts of the continent so, and what's interesting about this is, so the maternal line is clearly indigenous. And you, so again, you start seeing that. Um, so when I show you my paternal line, you know what I mean by that, but you know, my, that's, so my, my female line is indigenous. So that, so it's an unbroken line. Um, so I don't, so my female ancestors were not European. They were all indigenous. And it's interesting because even with, um, like black people, when they take DNA tests, there's so there's so there's specific group, um, DNA for black people to connect to them, to connect them, connect them to their African roots, and usually they also look at the maternal line because the paternal line um, are usually European, um, so so they want to trace the female line. So again, so that's so that's kind of interesting. Like you know, despite my mixture, like you know, the all the women women on my mother's line, we're all um, indigenous. Okay, so then the paternal line, so it, that's an unbroken paternal line. So it's a, it's a gene that's passed down from father to son. And so that's my, that's my so this is my, my line is RM167. And it's a, clearly, it's a European line. Um, it's more common in people from Ireland, Wales, Spain, France, Germany, Pol uh, Poland, Greece, and Turkey. So again, like we look, look at history, if a European raped my ancestor and had a boy, now that boy has that European line. And let's say that from there on, even if my family never mixed with another European, um, it's still gonna, like that line is still gonna be a European line. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, so again, this is kind of like, it makes sense in a way like if I'm if I have like European blood that it comes from the maternal line paternal line because again of histo of history and and again of this like rape of our people it makes sense that, that I would have this line and um and because Europeans are more like recorded and all that stuff so my paternal line actually supposedly it's uh, I share a common ancestor from I think he's like, he's um, like a Irish king or something from, yeah, it's from like the fourth century. So I share like DNA um, with him. I don't know if it means like I have like direct ancestor, but at least like there's, there's like, a, there's like the same, like we have, I share the same genetic uh, paternal line as this Irish king, I guess. So it's kind of, so again, like we can't, from our indigenous side, we don't have those these kind of records because again, we suffered a, like an invasion in the Holocaust, but again, like Europeans have like 
extensive records and you could like trace you know your european line probably like i don't know how far like as far as you can um so finding your indigenous roots um how so people say like how do i start how do i know uh, where do i where, like where do i go and i will say start with your family um just ask like ask any ask all your relatives the old the older one just ask anybody you can because um you don't know who might know the answers because my family we have been in the u.s for over like a whole 130 years like the earliest migration that i've that i've seen so far was 1890 um from mexico so most of my grandparents are born here and my parents are born here so and that it's it was really hard because no one asked questions, no one like really cares to know. Um, but again, because I found that one cousin who had an aunt who's like 90 years old, 98, and she's my grandma's first cousin. So she knew all this history. And I was talking to the, to my cousin Yvette, and she was like saying, Yeah, like no one else knows this but her. So, you know, again, just ask the oldest relatives you can find, just really start asking people because I think people. Most people, I don't know. I mean, you might have some people that share who, they, like, where they come from. But if you don't, if you don't ask your relatives, they don't, they don't really tell you. Um, so start with your families from, like, look at um, the town. Um, you know, once you know, like, where they're from, um, then look at and study like the indigenous groups that were there. Um, <clears throat> and again, like half of my half of my like ethnicities are kind of they're like they're more like speculations because I don't really know exactly for sure like I only know what I've been told and I know and I'm kind of going through like records and seeing like where my family was from so it's, so this right here is this in so wait let me go back so again ask family members and then online resource that I found was really interesting was really good it's called familysearch.com or org and these this is kind of interesting because this is run by the Mormon church. Um, the Mormons have like excellent records, um, particularly Mexican records, and because they were trying to convert, you know, Mexicans into Mormonism. So they extracted the records. So Mormons are obsessed with like genealogy because they believe that, um, let's say I convert to Mormonism. So, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna help me find out who my ancestors are because they believe they believe in if they believe in baptism of dead relatives. So um, when they, you know, when you, I guess they want to save them. So they they want to, so they want to know like who your family is. So they have like very good records on this. Um, and you know, you know, so it's this is um, so it helps if you know like if you know, you know, like your family's full names, if you know their birthdays, if you know at least the area where they're from, because it kind of gets tricky because um, you start seeing, start seeing things like names are spelled wrong, um, last names are spelled wrong, um, birthdays are not the same birthday as you were told, um, maybe people are using nicknames. Um, like for me, like a lot of family members become like Juan or the, and then they're John you know in the next record or um they're like I have a I have one great grandma her name is Lena and I can't find her because she only she only her and and my and her husband only appear when their kids get married which is because they got married in the U.S. but they don't but I can't find like their like their birthdays or like their birth certificates or marriage certificates I can't, baptisms because like Lena, it could be short for Magdalena, Maria Elena. So I don't know her full name. So, I, so that's, that's why I can't find like where she was from. So you have to like really like just kind of like, so I mean, it's, it's kind of easy, to, it's kind of easy to use. I mean, you, kinda, you go on it and you click, you know, you, you click record and then it kind of um, start putting people's names in. And then when, so when you find a record, you could click on their name and then other records will appear um like again like you know like baptism census records um you know like i like just even doing this we i started doing this i started doing this maybe a few months ago so even doing this I, you know i found out that so my grandma was born in california but i found out that half her siblings were born in texas half of them were born in um, new mexico and then 
she was born in she was born in Orange County with her brother, and I didn't I didn't even like I've never heard of that before, so I didn't I didn't know they were born you know in different states. But you see like you see a migration from you know Coahuila and from you know New Mexico, Texas, and California, and I didn't even know where her parents were from. So I was so it was kind of cool to find that they're from Coahuila, and that took a lot of digging because it was just um, because. Even though his name was Patricio Hernandez, he had, an, he had another name was Jose Patricio. Um, and then, and the only reason why we kind of found him was because he got remarried and he put the names of his um, parents' name. And I can't find the marriage certificate from his first wife. So my great grandma, I can't find records of her because her, her name is Maria, um, Maria Renteria, but I don't know if that's her full, like, what's her full name? She had a second name or a second last name, so I can't find her at all, but, you know, again, because I was digging around Patricio, I was able to find, you know, other records that indicated who his parents were, so it's kind of exciting. You can, you can actually build your family tree on there. I haven't done it yet, but um, I know Sigalali has, but when you build, so when you start building the tree, um, I guess records start appearing up and then you could kind of like add it to your record. And so it kind of does it for you. Um, and you could like start building your family tree through records. Um, so that's a really fun resource. Um, so yeah. When and just to, sorry, just to let everyone know the, the links that uh, with Yolo is sharing, they are found in the video for tonight. So you'll see it in the video description. There is a lot of links that he's talking about referencing. And if I can just add as far as family research, it's really interesting, like you're saying, because in speaking to the elders in my family, you know, my family, the one that I know more of, they're from Huchitlan, Jalisco. And, you know, they were, they came up in really, really impoverished towns, you know, in ranchos. And so when I asked them, hey, you know, well, what, you know, how was the city records maintained or how was that documented? And honestly, my aunts would tell me, my great aunts told me like, Mija, like, honestly, when you, when you guys were born, you know, like it was just dirt and it was like a town of like 20, 30 people. And we didn't have time to go register you with the city till later on, you know? So that adds to the, to the confusion, you know, cause I know there's family um, from my husband's side that the birthdays are wrong. So they've been celebrating their birthday on certain days. But according to the records, it's way off, you know? So it's like, and that's what they're talking about. Like, how does poverty impact this? How does, you know, demographics access to, to the city records? There's so much, you know, like you're talking about with family research. Um, like my, my, grand, my great grandfather, he came straight from Huchitlan to Compton um, in the 40s. Um, and it's interesting because it populated, you know, none of my family members know exactly what city he was born, but interestingly on family research, you know, his information, his death record came out, his death certificate came out. So at least, you know, I get a closer, you know, detail to his life. And then I find out that he was a bracero. So I think the important thing about this, like you're sharing is not just finding and not just basing it on DNA. DNA is one part of, of, our, our, of our research, but like what you're showing, there's this whole aspect of research, of doing oral traditions, oral histories, you know, and I think that adds to it. And like what, what I have researched is the Mexican census and how they collect data in Mexico is very distorted, right? And it's a process of, of whitening up the, the population. So you find that aspect happening all over, you know, so-called U.S. So I thought that was very interesting. Like you're saying, it's so hard to find official records. And that's why archives are so problematic. But in speaking to your elders, you'll see that it's not, it wasn't easy. It's not like today, like a kid's born and bam, you go register them. And, you know, it's all, it's all there. Like generations ago, it was very, very hard, you know? And so we're trying to piece together something that has been sabotaged by white supremacy, by poverty, uh, by governments that want to, you know, ignore the indigenous population. So, but I wanted to share that. So links are on uh, the, the video description. So sorry, brother. You don't to no, add that. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> My little two cents. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. So um, again, um, when people ask, you know, like me, like, how do you identify, like, how do you know what you are, right? And like I said, like, so on my dad's side, um, 
he, my dad, like, referenced that he, that they're from Chihuahua, and he said they're um, not a Mori, which was kind of interesting because it was very specific, but I asked other people, other cousins or other aunts and uncles, and they're just like, I don't know, like, they have, like, no idea, but my dad was so specific. I'm like, okay, so maybe there's some, you no. Know, so I'm, I'm more inclined to believe him because I was like, how, like, where does my dad come up with this? You know, like he had to know something. Um, unfortunately, he died when I was 17 and I didn't really like get to know him in that sense where we could talk about this kind of stuff. And so he never shared with me this information. But then, um, but I just know through like other people that what they told me about my dad. And then my dad's dad, my grandpa, Paul, he would always say he was Paula and Paula's from San Diego. Um, so there's a reservation in, in San Diego. And he would say, yeah, like it's almost Indios and, and people were like, no, you're crazy. Like no one believed them, right? And um, <clears throat> so like no one, no one believed them. And, um, but again, um, he said, but he would always say he was Paula. And um, so when my aunts were telling me, when they were doing their research on, on, their, on my grandpa, they, can't, they couldn't even find a, they can't find a birth certificate. They didn't find like a birthday. They didn't know where he was born. Like he didn't have social security. He didn't have, he didn't have anything. And it was kind of odd. It was kind of odd to me. But then again, when I looked at history, it, let's, let's say he was born on a reservation in San Diego. Um, Native Americans weren't even considered citizens yet. But, but so, if it, so, so they estimated him that he was born in 1907. So I think it was 1924 where Native Americans became U.S. citizens. So, I mean, I don't know, if maybe I need to go to the church in San Diego. I don't know, but he has no record of being born, basically. And I can't find, like, his family. I know their names, but I can't find where they're from either. Uh, someone said another aunt uh, referenced Zacatecas, too. Um, but, again, no one else knows that. So they could be from Zacatecas. They could be from Paula. Maybe one's from Paula. So, but, you know, so I, so I honor that ethnicity because of what, that's what my grandpa said. And then... Um, and then the rest is kind of the speculation of like where, again, like I, so I, I wrote Apache here because you know at Southwest and um, like you know, like New Mexico area, and then I have other parts of me that, that are from Zacatecas too. So and Coahuila, so I talk so I say Zacateco and I say that I'm um, Guachichil, and, um, and I say Mayan features because like someone told me once, oh like you have. Um, like Mayan fingernails because I have really unique I guess unique hands or fingernails and someone goes oh yeah you look like they look Mayan I'm like okay cool like I always say and I always say I have a Mayan head so I'm like cool if I have Mayan features that's you know that's that's cool and then um but actually I want to share a story about um about um being that Amori because you know again you kind of come along with people that say you can't claim this um uh, people are not going to accept you you can't just go to a pueblo and say oh hey like I am not Amori uh, please accept me, right? But uh, I met this lady. She was I was it was in grad school. She was a guest speaker, and when I so when she was done, I, I went up to her and I said, "Oh, hey, like hi, my, my name is so and so. Like I just want to say, I just want to let you know that I'm I'm also Rara Mori." And the first thing she said was, "That's interesting because when I first saw you, I thought you were my son because you, you look like him, and then I could tell because of your eyes." So I thought that was you know a cool. Story you know, things she told me, like, she kind of, like, validated, um, you know, validated my identity, and then, um, and there's also this author, he's from, he wrote a book called Always Running, um, Luis Rodriguez, and he talks, so in one of his books, he talks about how he, he went to Chihuahua, where his family's from, and he met the Raramori people, and then they also told him, it's good, it's good that you came back, because when our people leave, they never come back, so our people, you know, they are waiting for us to come back to our roots. Like they're not just like, not gonna accept us. Like they want us to come back. They want us to embrace who we are. Um, Cause I'm sure they understand like, you know, what happened when you, know, when you leave your town, um, you know, you kind of assimilate and things happen and, and they do want, you know, us to come back. Even, even with African people, you see black people going back to Africa and finding like they're, they go to the town they're from or the little village or city. And people say, oh, welcome back. Like, you know, you're back home. Like you, like you are the stolen children and we, we want you to, to come back. And so there, there is this, so there is this, lo there, is, there is this like longing of our people that they want us to go back to, to, to who we are. And um, so I thought that was pretty cool. And I, so that was kind of interesting how, you know, 
you get, you, I mean, when you, when, you, when, you to, when you start to explore your identity, you get a lot of negative people like saying, you can't claim this, you can't do that. You're, you're appropriating a culture that you don't belong to. And it's like, again, we understand history and you, when you understand why, like we don't know who we are, why we're so disconnected, it's because it was a systematic destruction of, of you know, of our identity. Like it was purposely, it was on purpose. It was, you know, my family that grew up, you know, they're from the U.S. So they went through Americanization where, um, you know, even like my grandma was hit for speaking Spanish in school. Um, she, they were segregated. It was like, it was a Mexican school and a white school in Orange County. So again, like we, there's, so there's this process of like whitewashing us uh, from our indigenous roots. And then we come here and it's like a whitewashing of our Mexican roots. And uh, <clears throat> so again, so it, it just, when you, you had to claim who you are. Like you can't let no one tell you otherwise. And uh, so over here, I'm gonna show you. So over here, it says Mexican. Mexico and Central America where I guess my DNA, um, these are the top regions of where my DNA comes from. Um, some of us interesting because, so Jalisco is number one and that's where my grandpa, I have, so I have one grandparent from Mexico and that's Jalisco is number one. And then I have, so I have, I have roots in Zacatecas, um, Chihuahua, I've heard of Durango and I heard of Coahuila. Um, it's funny because Michoacan is number two and it's funny because <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm in this group chat, so shout out to um, Shalisco. He's um, we're in a we're in a Chichimeca group, and he. So I never met him before, but I just I know, I know him online. And like the other day, before like when I was doing this, um, he said, "Oh, you give me Micho Michoacan vibes," <laughs> and I was like, "Like what does that even mean? <laughs> like what does that mean?" <laughs> and then he was just like, "I don't know. Like you remind me of my friend. He's from Michoacan, and you have the same eyes too, or you have like it's in your eyes." And I'm like. You know, jokingly they say, "Oh, well, I have, I have that, I have, I have, you know, that that that, that Amori eyes." But it was just interesting how this guy like kind of pointed out to me, like, "Oh, like, you, you remind me from someone from Michoacan," and I think it's funny how it's number two. Um, I don't know any family from Michoacan. Again, since my fam my family history is kind of disconnected. I mean, who kn I might have someone from Michoacan that that could pop up, but who knows? But it's kind of funny how it's number two, and then um. And again, so when you when you look at like your family history, even like the town they're from, it's it's still it's the reason why it's kind of hard to claim that those groups of people is because again, our people were scattered all over the continent, right? So um, you know that's what you you have the Wistecs that are from they're from San Luis Potosi, they ended up in Puerto Rico. Uh, you have you know Yaquis ended up from the south or the north. So you have all these people like just being transported and enslaved by the Spanish. And so, you know, we might think, oh, like I'm this group, but then maybe it turns out you're in a different group. But again, it, it's, it's kind of hard. To, it might be hard to track all that information. But so when, so that's why I, I don't feel, so I feel comfortable. Like if I see like a, a certain place, like a town or area where my family's from, I feel comfortable enough to like, okay, maybe I am this group, group of people. And I feel okay claiming that because I mean, we have to, I mean, I don't know, to me, it's like, well, at least I have like a, a connection to a place um, in Mexico because, you know, someone says, oh, well, what's the, what's the benefit? What's the, like, why do you care about where you're from in Mexico? And it's because again, like, even though I know this is our land and it's our continent and let's say I do have roots in California, I know I have roots in Mexico. And so to be like connected to like a specific land base in Mexico um, is meaningful to me because I don't know, like it, it's like a, it just, it, it helps me get rooted uh, in, in like where I'm from and who I am. And um, just because my ancestors left like a hundred and something years ago, like that doesn't mean that's not, still not a part of me. And um, like my family's still Mexican. Like we, like we're not, like we weren't like, you know, mixing with other people. Um, but um, so it just gives me that, it just gives me that like, that root that that root and that I'm rooted in an area or different all oh, my kids I'm rooted in different areas in Mexico because my family's all over the place but um so it's so, so, they, so there's that and then um so what's cool about this test is that it kind of gives you like it kind of gives you characteristics of like um just like I don't know random, random facts about you so like this one says um I have so most of my my relatives are you know we have I guess our hair becomes frizzy in the winter or in humid, in humid, we humid weather, humid weather. And then uh, this says like 90%, 98% of my relatives have Native American ancestry. So it's 
So again, most of my, again, just validates that most of my family is Native American. Um, so interestingly enough, I, I, I have found, I did find like 100% like white relatives and I found like a few of them and I found a few African or black relatives. And um, again, like a few, so it's kind of interesting, so it's kind of, you know, interesting how that pops up. And I'm thinking maybe the white, like the, my 100% white relatives probably come from like the African black side because maybe they were, in, maybe they enslaved, you know, like one of my ancestors and so you start seeing like white people. So, cause those white relatives are also relatives with my black relatives. So when you have, when you look at this, when you look at, when you look at um, your, the 23andMe, it links you up with like cousins or family that have taken, have, that have taken the test and when you find a cousin, you, you click uh, related, you click um, similar relatives. So it, so it pops up the relatives we have in common. So I found, so like I said, so I found a few, like maybe like 10 black relatives compared to like, And then when I click on their profiles, some of them, so we're also connected to other, like to white relatives. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like, you know, like, you start seeing like this, like uh, the history of like enslavement of white people, like how they enslaved, you know, African people. And so that was kind of interesting. Um, let me see, wait up, what happened? Okay, so family, I think, I, I, so this, this was a bit before, but whatever, uh, family research. So, th so th here's an example of a document from family search. Yeah, family search. And, um, this is, I, this is why I chose this. I chose this because this is this is my great great grandmother Margarita. This is her father. Um, her father is Juan Pueblo de, de los Lores Recino, and it's a baptism record and it's from Coahuila. So what's interesting enough is that when we look down. So this is the first time I saw race in the in like the Mexican document or yeah. So this is like from the so this is from the Catholic. Catholic Church, so the, the church, so what's cool about this website too, like you could also look at um, original records. Um, so this is a church record. And so they wrote down, you know, all this stuff, right? Like the gender, the race, the families, family, father's name, mother's name. So on race, you look at, um, it's an I, and an I indicates Indio. And I think that's kind of interesting because uh, like to me, that's like full, like he's like, push, maybe he was like full blood because um, Mexico, so the Spanish created this caste system in Mexico, um, which is basically like the birth of like colorism in our community because um, it was in place like between 1530s to 19, it was a, finally abolished until 1821. So when we look at the record where he was born, he was born in 1819. So just like, two years after he was born, um, that was abolished. They abolished the caste system in Mexico. So if you, if you could like, if you Google like caste paintings in Mexico, um, you, start, you start seeing like these different, um, different groups of people. So what the Spaniards did that the Spaniards, they created um, out of indigenous European and African people, they created like hundreds of categories of race, like just based on how much African, how much indigenous you have, um, being white, being full Spaniard was the top, being African was at the bottom. And then it was like, and then in, like being an Indian was like second to last. And then everybody else was like above all that. So depending on how much, again, how much African and, and how much native blood you had. So some examples were mestizo. So we, we, that's kind of a common thing that we hear more often. Um, some people think that would like probably like, oh, well, I'm mestizo, or like we're all mestizo. And again, that's not like accurate, like we're not all like mixed, but um, so mestizo basically means indigenous in Spanish, but there's other like connotations. It means illegitimate uh, because uh, again, the first mestizo that were born um, was like the 1530s and they were a product of rape. And um, so, so they were, you know, they were, Basically, it's, you're saying that you're, you're calling them a half breed. Um, you're not. You're not really indigenous. You're not Spanish. Um, you're illegitimate again because your your parents weren't married. And even like um, 
in Mexico City, the first orphanages appear in 1530s because a lot of women were basically abandoning their children and um, like the, I guess the mixed children. So it's, so you sorry, so, so again, like there's like this negative connotation like between, it's, I mean, it's basically a racist term. Um, so I don't like, I don't feel comfortable claiming that word as my identity, oh, like as my identity, even though yes, technically I am like Spanish and indigenous. That's not what I am. I don't identify with that label. Um, and then another word that was kind of common is mulato, which is um, African and Spanish. And then, but it means, but it also means mule. So it's like, it's, so it's like you have these zoological terms that are being applied to people. And then you see lobo, which is like a wolf and that's indigenous and African um, mixture. So again, and then, and then, there, and then there's like, com and then there's combinations of all these things. So you start seeing like these, like they're, I mean, they're really going deep into like how they're categorizing people based on like blood or blood quantum, as you could say. Um, so I thought it was kind of interesting how like my ancestor, I mean, I, I could have seen an L, I could have seen an M, I could have seen like all kinds of, I could have seen, I could have seen a, a bunch of things that when it comes to their race, but I saw an I. So, um, even though, so again, they, even though they say he's an Indio, they don't really, but they don't really say like what kind, like they don't know, like they're not, they're not telling me what was his ethnicity, they just say Indio. Um, so I, so that, so I thought that was, was a pretty interesting um, tidbit. Uh, Cause when I saw that, I'm like, oh, well, like, that was the first time I saw, I saw that, I saw the race um, on a Mexican record. And I think if I go back more, I'll probably start seeing like, you know, the like race and you know who like how my people, my um, family was being labeled in Mexico. Um, so another character. So this is another characteristic trait that I is kind of it's kind of interesting because I mean this is this, this is not like the whole like. Spectrum, there's more, but I'm just kind of, I just took a, just a snap of, of one of them. Um, so ability, so again, it tells you like, oh, like you're more likely to able to match a musical pitch. Um, that means I'm, if I hear like a musical note, I could probably imitate it with my voice. Um, I never thought I'm, a, I never thought I'm like a, I never thought like to be a, like a singer or whatever, but um, it was funny because I, I had an, a student, she was, she had autism and she was very musical and she like sang all day long. So what people will like, so people will try to sing with her. And if you're a really bad singer, she will like cover her ears and say, oh, please stop singing. Like you're hurting my ears and because they couldn't carry the note. And, but if I like, so, so I said, well, let me, let me see how I am. Let's see how, let's see how she judges my voice. So I'll, so I'll start singing with her and I guess, I guess I'm matching her pitch and then she'll, Start, she'll start singing so I'm like okay I guess I guess for her like I'm good so that, but then so it's kind of funny how it, how it pops up in my DNA like uh, you're able to match musical pitch um another one that's interesting to me was the cilantro taste aversion it says slightly higher odds to not like cilantro right and I and like I never like cilantro it like it's overpowering like it tastes like like well, if, I, if I if I eat it in tacos I only taste that I don't taste anything else and then people always say, oh, well, it should enhance the flavor. And I'm like, no, I just taste cilantro. But when you click on like the little arrow over right here on the on the right, it kind of tells you like more. So apparently I have a, a gene that when I eat cilantro, it tastes like soap. <laughs> and um, so it's not like, it's not my opinion that, oh, I don't like cilantro. It, it's in my genes. Like I don't like, you don't like it because you have a gene that makes it taste like soap. So, um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, and then, then I, just, you know, just other stuff like, you know, I won't go bald, hopefully, and um, my eyes are brown, and um, I have detached earlobe. So it kind of, so kind of tells you like more like what's like what's really in your genes. Um, so that's so that's kind of interesting. So I, that's why that's an interesting little tidbit of twenty three and me. <clears throat> I think that's it. <laughs> Wow, that, that was a lot. That was a lot. Brother Witsi Yolo, thank you so much for sharing, you know, your personal DNA results. I think that was awesome. I hope that uh, people were able to learn um, and maybe serve as an example. But now I, I, I do have a couple of things I wanted to bring up. Um, and looking back at my notes here. So at this point, I wanted to ask you, 
and you i think you can close there you go so at this thing again thank you so much for for sharing that and at this point with you lord i wanted to ask you you know what's what's been the process your particular personal process with finding your indigenous identity and i think a lot of people it, it's important to understand that a lot of us are displaced a lot of us have been uprooted from our original you know cities and communities and so i think the tools of dna the tools of, of family search and other you know oral histories or traditions there's so much um, that we can use to to recover who we are and i think a lot of people not knowing the process of genocide not knowing how systemic it was as far as how they they did forced migrations and we know that our brothers and sisters up north you know they had the trail of tears like they were massive displacements of yeah. indigenous populations and so you know that's another layer that adds to the complexity here um but anyway on your particular journey what Maybe how did you think of yourself growing up before you started learning your true identity and history? And how has it changed, you know, maybe in the last 10 years, 12 years? Yeah, so being um, third generation Mexican is very, I guess, interesting because I don't know, like for me, I always said I was Mexican. And the, so, the, but I remember specifically where, so, the only so the first time I remember that I was that I that I said I was Mexican was um so I still live in Anaheim and then I moved to Santa Ana and if you don't know it's like Santa Ana and Anaheim are very different so Santa Ana is so Anaheim is like you know it's like Mexican people that have maybe been there for maybe longer generations um you have more white people there but then I moved to Santa Ana and it was um it was more Mexicans, but they were like born in Mexico. So either their parents were born. So my, so my peers either were born in Mexico or their parents were born in Mexico. So I'm like seven years old and I'm in a new school. You know, I'm talking to people, people are speaking to me in Spanish. So at, at that point, I didn't learn Spanish yet. So I didn't know what they were saying to me. And they go, oh, you don't know Spanish? And I'm like, no, they go, oh, so you're white. And I'm like, no, I'm Mexican. They're like, no, you're not. Like you're like you're like you don't know Spanish. You're you're born here, so are your parents, so you're white. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, so that's what so that's the first time I remember like defending my identity was I was being I was accused of being white because I didn't speak Spanish or my parents were born here. And then um, <clears throat> so then I learned Spanish and that's to blend in. So like people, so then when people start speaking to me, I knew what they were saying. And um, it was just, I wanted to know, I wanted to learn Spanish so I wouldn't kind of be questioned all the time. And then, because and people assume I was Mexican, but because of language, then, then they go, oh, well, now well, you're white. <laughs> and um, so I, that's, so I just, I knew I was Mexican. And then when I was about 10 years old, um, my I had a grandparent that died, but before he died, um, so he's from, so he's from Jalisco and he had like blue eyes and I was like, why does he look white? Like, why does he look like that? Because I, like, I guess in my mind already, I knew that Mexicans were brown, and and it was more confusing because he was the only family born in Mexico, and he was the only white-looking one, and while everybody else was brown, right? And I'm trying to figure out if that, if him looking white was either because he was white or because maybe again genetics, recessive genes, or um, my mom, she's not. So that's my mother's dad. My that's my mother's father and she's not she's not 50 percent european so i'm guessing he was probably just mixed and he just looked white um but um yeah so that just confused me like i was like i was just like why does he look like that and then so when he died i finally asked my mom like why does he have like why does he have blue eyes and then she said oh well he's spanish and french <laughs> and i was like like wait but he's mexican and then she was yeah but he's like he's like more your he's like european and i was like so that kind of like blew my mind at 10 years old. And I'm like, well, what is Mexican? Like, what does that mean? And, um, you know, and like for the record, like I like to me, Mexican means like indigenous. Like I don't prescribe to that notion of nationalism, not, not, national identity where you're only like you're Mexican if you're born, if you're born in Mexico. And again, like I don't because Mexican is an indigenous label. It came from Mexica. So the Spanish basically stole that identity and put it for everybody. Um, so some people don't like it, especially people who have, who know the roots, they don't like Mexican and that's fine. But um, Mexican is to me an indigenous label and identity. So that's why I don't prescribe, that's why I don't 
call like Salma Hayek Mexican because she's Spanish and Arabic and so stuff like that. I don't like, you know, so to me, I hold my, that Mexican label like very like dear. Um, but um, <clears throat> so even when my mom said he was Spanish and Spanish, I'm like, wait, like, I, like, I, I was like, so, so he's white, right? So then it's like, so I was basically trying to explore like Mexico, like what is Mexico? What is Mexican? So I remember, so as I got into high school, I remember, so I remember like, I'll say, oh yeah, I'm like Native American and I'm like Spanish and French. I remember I'll, I will say that, um, but I was like, but I still, but I wanted to know more. I always wanted to know more of my Native roots. Like I always wanted to, then I learned, you know, in high school that, I, oh, well, you're from Paula and like you're from Chihuahua and whatever. So then I was, I was learning more, but I, I wanted to know like specifics. And I remember in high school, I remember, um, like reading books on Mexico and like Central America and like you know you, you hear the same things like you know oh yeah like they're indigenous and then Spanish came and now we're all then we're all mestizo and some have African roots so I was just like okay so I, mean, I guess I'm mestizo or whatever <laughs> and then and then, um, and then I, rem I remember I remember I went to powwows in high school I had a friend who was she was actually Cherokee uh, and she looked white but I did meet her. Um, grandma who was Cherokee and you know her grandma had this bad history of like being in boarding school and you know she got she was stolen from her family and went to boarding school and she learned English and you know she married a white man and then her daughter married a white man and had my, had my friend so um you know but I, I know we hear I know we always hear like this white white people claiming Cherokee but in this case it was true <laughs> just because I met, the, I met the grandma so she would take me to powwows and like her house had like Native American stuff all over it and um so I was kind of like fascinated by that and then I would go to like powwows and I I didn't I didn't feel like I didn't find what I was looking for I didn't find I was trying to, I guess I was trying to find connection I was trying to find like something and you know powwows are really cool I mean I guess it's, I guess the benefit of powwows are like you, it's communal you meet, you meet all these people and um, people are selling like you know art and their crafts and pottery which is just cool but I guess I was looking for like maybe I don't know what maybe educational component of it and I wasn't finding that or I wasn't finding like maybe I was looking for like Mexican indigenous people I don't know but I, I didn't find what I was looking for in powwows and then um then my sister was like like she was she was older than me she would like read like Native Native American books and she would like uh, we'll watch like Native American movies all the time. So, I mean, I think I was always drawn to it. Um, but I just, again, I didn't, but as I got older, I didn't feel comfortable claiming it because I didn't know my history. I didn't know my roots. I didn't know my language. So I didn't feel confident enough to claim, you know, indis indigenous. So then I went to Chicano studies <laughs> and, and I majored in Chicano studies in, high, in college. And um, again, like, this notion of Mexicans or Spanish and indigenous were the conqueror and the con and the and were the conqueror and were the um, conquered or whatever. So again, it's this idea that we're two races combined and and um, and then grad school happened and then I started meeting people like Siklali. I met in my cohort. I was lucky enough to where a lot of people in my cohort were very like indigenous minded, like whether it was through danza or through other stuff and they're very confident in their like indigenous roots. And um, so I was like, you know, so I, I think with this all like being active and learning, learning from Siklali and other people, like I just like, okay, now I just kind of felt more comfortable, you know, accepting my, my identity as indigenous. I started reading more books. Um, I started learning about the history. And I think once you know, like, again, once you, once you know the history, once you know why you don't know who you are, you know, why we're so disconnected, um, it, it makes, it, to me, it makes it more. It, ma it makes more sense to like, okay, well, now I could claim it and not feel guilty, or not feel like I'm appropriating because um, it was not. It wasn't like our people just gave up who they were. I mean, th it was they had to. It was forced. It was forced upon them. So, um, so yeah. So I guess I feel like my journey started when I was like seven, and then, <laughs> and then even like now I'm like 34, and I'm still like learning. Like you know, now I'm, now I'm actually learning like where what parts of Mexico my family's from now like and like I'm now I'm finding like actual like cities and towns and um that I didn't know before like like I didn't like I, like literally I found out like you know two months ago where my grandma's family was from because I had no idea which was, where, where they were from so you know I guess it's a journey I think I'm always gonna I'm gonna always want to learn more and you know it's it, you know we kind of had to it's kind of sad that most of us maybe never might never know who we are we might never find like 
you know, a record or something that tells you, oh, well, you're Mayan, you're Borepicha, you're this. And, um, you know, I think it's kind of like we had, it's kind of almost like, I don't know, like it's kind of like a, almost like a morning, like we might never exactly know for sure. Um, and, you know, and again, some people might never know because, you know, there was, you know, you find out that, you know, their family, they were, they were orphaned, um, their dad was adopted or just different things that we might never like really know. But I think, you know, I think now we have the, the technology, we have the resources, we have the tools, we have the, you know, we're able to like actually go online. But even let's say we never, let's say people don't know who their family is. I mean, we still have, you know, the Mexican label that we could like take pride in and like, like learning about like, you know, Mexica history. And because again, a lot of Mexican culture is still tied to like Mexica um, culture. And um, so we can take pride in that. We could take pride in being Mexica. We could take pride, you know, again, that's, Mexica, the Mexica identity, like, or the Aztec, what, what, we call, what we call Aztec, you know, we have a lot of resources, we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of history on them, we have a lot of information on them where we could like, okay, cool, like, this is our cultural heritage, and maybe not directly um, our lineage, but it's still our cultural heritage, kind of like how Europeans, how white people kind of, they may not claim Greek and Roman, but they take a lot of influence from the Greeks and Romans, and uh, in you know their education system, their philosophy, their political like it, it, they're just they're, they're still taking influence from their greatest civilizations in Europe. And as Mexican people, we could take pride in our greatest civilization, which is the Mexica or the Mayan, or um, just we could take pride in we could take pride in that as our cultural heritage, even if you may never know exactly what you are, or if you don't feel comfortable like kind of like okay, well I'm from here, so I guess I'm this. And you know some people might not feel comfortable doing that either. But um, but at least we have like a Mexican label that we that we could. Then once you learn the history of Mexica, like it, it may be able to take pride in that. Um, if anything, at least at least that. If you if so, don't feel discouraged that you might never know who you are. But there's but you know again, just look at the resources and look at the just look at the websites and just kind of like ask your family and then you know kind of take it from there. But um, yeah, I mean you know regardless of what, what of of who we are like our in terms of our ethnicity we're still indigenous and i think we should take pride in, in in that at least yeah no and um lots of community for sharing and i also wanted to point out that you know making us have to justify that we're indigenous and explain and bust out charts that's part of the system of white supremacy that's part of policing brown bodies on our stolen continent and i think that politically at the end of the day it's, you know, that's what feels so sad, right? That it's yeah. like, when you talk to other ethnicities, you know, most of the time they're clear on who they are. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm black or I'm, I'm Chinese or I'm this. But when it comes to our people, all of a sudden it's like, well, what tribe are you from? Well, do you speak the language? Well, what community are you from? And it's like, you know, I'm not speaking for all indigenous people, but my particular history, you know, unfortunately, due to forces, forced relocations, due to the forced impover you know, impoverishment of our communities, you know, I don't have that connection. And I think that's what people don't understand, that first and foremost, we shouldn't have to carry our DNA results and, and all this to state who we are. And I wanted to share something. I went to the Indigenous Peoples March last year. I had the great honor to be there with my sister, Janet. Shout out Janet from Brown Mujeres Media. And I was hosted by the Onondaga and uh, many other people of the Haudenosaunee Nations, not Iroquois, Iroquois is a fake, a fake name. Um, and it was beautiful because all, all my native brothers and sisters that I came across, they were all like, oh, what nation are you from? Oh, what's up sister, what nation are you from? There was no question about, well, are you really, or are you, or like, I didn't feel like I had to justify and explain myself. Cause here in, in Tongva territory, I'm so used to like, even having to defend, we are indigenous. We're not Hispanic, we're not Latino. You know, Mexican is a nationalized indigenous term. You know what I mean? But when I went to Onondaga territory and I stood and I was, I was, you know, in a home of the Onondaga and the Haudenosaunee, and I learned so much about their perspective and their history. It felt so beautiful to just be, right? To just be who we are in this space, to be indigenous, to create solidarity, to create unity. 
and not to feel like I had to constantly fight and constantly explain. And I thought that was, that really changed my life. I mean, this was recently last year because it's very different, right? When we're being policed in our communities and like Federico Navarrete, for those of you who have been watching my courses, I really talk about him because he's a Mexican anthropologist, a Mexican historian, sorry. And he talks about, you know, how language is so important um, in indigenous communities and the Mexican, you know, uh, colonialist government of Mexico knows that. That is why it has assaulted indigenous communities. It's widened them up with the census. I mean, in Mexico, if you no longer speak your language, you're, no, you're not considered indigenous, right? And so there's so much, you know, history that we don't know. And he says, those of you who don't speak your language now, he said, ask your great grandparents, ask your grandparents, one of you did, right? A few generations ago, you were speaking your language. And I think that's powerful. And it speaks to the repression of indigenous cultures, the repression of indigenous identities and languages. And it's to tell us like, in my particular case, my from my mother's side in Cuchitlan, um, from my mother's no, sorry, from my great grandfather paternal side, he was the last one to speak Nahuatl, right? In Cuchitlan. And it's like, you know, and to me, when I when I changed my name, because I legally changed my name to Nawa name when I was 19, a long time ago. But to me, I felt like, you know, there's a way I can honor my ancestors. I can honor that generation that was embarrassed to speak it, that was pressured into this whiteness, pressured into this system of mestizaje. And it's real, you know? And so I wanted to get into that because it's important that people are like, oh, they critique, right? People that are trying to reclaim who they are and they, they call these derogatory names. But I think it's important to understand the displacement has not been of our choosing. It's not like we're like, oh, I'm done, like I'm gone, you know? Um, it, it comes as a product of, of genocide. It comes as a product of being assaulted for who you are. And, you know, when people say, oh, well, you know, just DNA is not enough and, and it's like, in the conversation we're having tonight, and I hope people take away from that, is that it's not just DNA that we're talking about. That's a tool that you can use. But most of us, we are still, right? We're eating our foods. We're speaking our languages, some of us more than others. And so we are indigenous. We are in, in, the, in the indigenous repressed reality. And so, you know, looking at a DNA result and then trying to uncover and unpack who we are, that's us trying to heal. That's us trying to reclaim and bring justice for our ancestors that could not, you know, bring this, could not um, embrace this, right? And so I, I think it's important to add that perspective because it's very troubling, you know, it, like that we have that policing amongst our communities um, or the colorism, or you're not light enough, you're not dark enough, you're not, you know, and this is a, a, an aspect of white supremacy that I want to point out because it's internalized, it's used against us. And like I've talked about it in the courses, there's genocide here, there's statistical genocide, there's this constant repression of who we are, you know, and I think it's important to, to speak to that. Um, Brother with Yolo, if we can talk about um, wh what do you say to people that are not, are like, no, that's not enough. You know, we're not indigenous. Like, you know, we're, we're Latinx, you know, there's this whole, this is whole uh, trend now, right? That it's not even trying to recover who we are. We're totally ignoring who we are. We're like, fuck it. I'm sorry, Confederate. It's a white world. We're not indigenous anymore. Get over it. That happened a long time ago. We're Latinx now. Like, what do we say to, to that? Sorry, you're kind of cutting. You're kind of cutting off. I don't know if that's me or you. Huh? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um. Wait. Can you give me a second? Yes. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go for a few more minutes. I am reading uh, some of the questions and comments that we're leaving here. 
Um, I'm really, you know, I appreciate you joining me. I, this is complicated. It's not an easy thing. And I know we are, are on different journeys and have different approaches to this. But I thought it was very interesting that he can share, you know, his personal um, experience with this because it's important, right? A lot of our people, especially with this whole talk with the senses, there's a lot of talk about, well, who am I? What are we? And because it's, you know, manufactured into um, a, a federal definition of who we are, it makes it more problematic, right? And so I'm hoping that in these discussions and in these courses, we get to draw those connections and understand that us not being able or knowing where we come from, that's not a natural phenomenon. That This is a product of, like I said, of genocide, of a systematic uh, repression of our indigenous knowledge, of our indigenous identities, as diverse as they are, right? We're very diverse people. And so it's important, you know, it's important. Are you good? Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so your question was on Latinx, right? Latinx and the people that say we're not indigenous, we're Latinx now, you know, let's get over it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it just, it's a lot, right? Like, it's just, it, it's like the more we try to reclaim who we are, um, there's, other, there's like other attacks, right? So, you know, people maybe start getting, starting getting their, away from Latino and then all of a sudden Latinx comes comes along and you know and they try to package it like okay well it's for people who are um, non-binary or who are trans and and then which is you know it that it's cool but then all of a sudden everyone's saying Latinx like even though they're not like you have people that are that are not trans or not non non-binary and they'll say oh well I'm Latinx and it's like well <laughs> I mean, why can't you say Mexican, right? Like, I mean, Mexican is a, you know, Mexican is a, a, a non, you know, gen, non or a non-gender neutral term. Like Mexican doesn't have a gender or Mexica doesn't have a gender or being indigenous doesn't have, doesn't have a gender. Um, so again, like, or even Indiana doesn't have a gender, but again, it's like, I don't know. I think it's because it's trendy or because it's like, you know, and it gets me upset because then I start, you start looking at like Chicano studies, like articles and, or you start, you start seeing articles that's talking about like the Chicano movement and you start seeing, oh, well, in Latinx kids or, you know, Latinx uh, students from East LA. <laughs> and it's like, no, they were Chicano, not Latinx, right? Um, and I don't know, I just, I think, actually, I haven't heard people say that when we're, we're like, we're not, you know, we're not native, we're, we're more Latinx now, but I don't know, it's just kind of like people, well, I don't know, it's just like they just want, I guess the media wants us to like not identify who we are. So they're trying to make up a trendy word that, that feels more inclusive, that it's all um, gender inclusive or and it's like, well, Mexicans also like that. So I don't know why we need to create more terms. And again, we, we've been attacking Latino for so long. And um, even me, like I never felt comfortable being Latino. Like I don't like, I remember, like that wasn't a, that wasn't even a thing until until college, um, and um, and maybe because I don't watch Spanish media as much, but like I didn't like I I never heard of Latino for like until Chicano studies, which is ironic, right? And even like I I asked my mom, I'm like, have you heard Latino before? And she was like, she was like, she was well, she was, she was like, I first heard about it when I was when I was you know I was gonna take you to to register for junior high, you're in sixth grade, and um, they were asking for race, and you know, I didn't, I didn't find Mexican, so I left it blank. I saw Latino, but I didn't know what that meant. And then this lady, this person, so I when I turned it in, this guy said, "Oh, you, you forgot to put his race." And she goes, "Well, I don't see Mexican." And then he goes, "Well, you put Latino." And she was like, "Well, what does that even mean?" And no one couldn't, like, no one knew what, like, no one knew how to like define that, right? And um, and this lady, this white lady, was like, "Well, I'm just white, so I don't have that problem." But like all the other Mexicans that were on there were like they didn't even know like how, they didn't even know what to, what to say because they didn't know they, they they didn't even know what that meant. But they were pushing, I guess, parents to identify as Latino, and um, so like so yeah. So I mean, for me, it wasn't so hard to like get away from that label because I never used it anyways. 
And so then the more that I, so that, you know, sorry, you start noticing like people, how people use it. And, you know, you're with a group of friends and they're saying Latino. And we're like, well, like we're all Mexican here. Like, why are you like, there's no other people but Mexicans here. So why are you saying Latino? Like, you know, like this, you know, inclusive term, but it's like you're using it when you don't need to use it. I mean, I can understand if you don't know any better and you want to like, if you, if, if you have Salvadorians and Guatemalans around you, but we're all Mexican. So why is like Latino still being like, yep you know, be used. And again, when you look at the Spanish media, it's heavily like, they like, when I, like, when I watch like certain shows or not, or just even like a glimpse like the news, like they use, they use, they use Latino and Hispano like every other sentence, right? So it's like constantly like being used and how, and how they market like the Latin sector and how they market like in the Latin sector, oh, the Latin explosion, the 90s and the Latin sensations and like when Ricky Martin came out and Christina Aguilera. So it's all these things, right? Like you, you just kind of hear it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like, we don't need to, like, that's not who we are. Like there's, I don't, I don't know, like there's a, there's a whole history on, on Latino and how that came to be and how it's a marketing tool from the like, from the standard, like the Miami Cubans. Um, but yeah, like it's, I mean, I can't convince you not, I can't convince people not to use that word. People are going to use it regardless and people will sit there and defend it. And like, they'll say, yeah, I understand that label. And I know like, but I want to honor my other roots, which is, I guess, are Spanish roots. <laughs> it's like, okay, but you're completely denying your indigenous root by just saying that, like yeah. saying you're Latin X or whatever. Um, but all I can say is you, you have to do your own research. You have to, you know, look it up and see if it's like, if you find it, but relevant to you. I mean, I can say it's not, but again, I can't, I can't change people. I can't tell them what to do, but I could just tell you where it comes from and, and why we don't use it or how, and how, why I don't identify with that word. And then, you know, then you can make your own choice, but. Yeah, no, um, ex yeah. exactly. Um, you know, when you're talking about that and to me, looking at it with a pattern, I see that basically a lot of people are questioning Latino, Latinidad and all this. And so to me, I take it as a revamping of a word that was losing its purpose and its use in a marketing world and a capitalistic world where they're trying to just homogenize all brown people that speak Spanish, which to me is ridiculous because they don't do that to English speaking brown people. Like they don't categorize all Asian, black, uh, everyone that's not white that speaks English into a category, right? And so I think that the fact that Latinx is so embraced by the mainstream media to me tells you, you know, who's running this, who's, uh, who's, you know, benefiting from it, where the prop, who's profiting from this. Right. And so that's always been my problem because there's this whole thing about oneness and this unity, but it's like, why is this unity only being applied and expected from a Spanish speaking population, even if people do speak Spanish, a lot of people don't even speak Spanish. But I think it's really important to understand that because we're forced into these categories and said, oh no, you know, and, and I, I agree with you. I'm not convincing anyone. I'm not here to convince people and I'm here to share. We're here to share, create space with like-minded folks and people that wanna know a different perspective of the world that's not European based. Um, and I think it's important to talk about this because we, I, I'm very passionate about, you know, taking back our power and like in a lot of our indigenous communities, and this is something worldwide, and this is not just indigenous to, to the Western hemisphere, but uh, most communities identified based on the land that they're from, based on their specific region, maybe what food was grown there, what you found there. And I mean, through this process of global colonization and global white supremacy, that has been lost, right? Where people are forced into large groups to homogenize us and to make us lose our, our power, right? Our economic power that's connected with resources, with land, with economic, you know, infrastructures. And so I think that's important. You know, I think that's really important. And to understand that we are fighting uh, erasure. We're fighting being erased by, by history, by history textbooks, by governments, you know, and that's what we're here for tonight. And we wanted to uh, talk about that. We're going to go on for like about five more minutes. Um, there was a question here about um, somebody asked, you know, once you started learning your history, how did that change you? Did you feel like you belonged more? 
or as an outsider? How did that change how you were perceived? And then someone else was asking, what's the difference between DNA and tribal affiliation? Okay. Um, the, well, the first question, so I, I recommend a book called American Holocaust, uh, Conquest of the New World is by David E. Standard. And that book was life-changing, like in terms of my identity, how I saw religion, um, how I saw white, white people. Um, but again, when I read that book and you start, again, cause it talks about he, this. So this author basically is taking first, um, first-hand accounts. So this is like European writings or I guess eyewitnesses. And they're just writing like what they're doing to our people and how they're destroying us, how to, what like, you know, all the raping, all the, you know, all the killing, all the, I mean, the, all the gruesome act, like, I mean, it's, it's very brutal, um, you know, and kind of like you have to kind of be careful when you read it because it, it's, it's very sad and depressing. It might get you angry, but I mean, it is, I mean, it is, that's what happened to us. So once I started learning just how, like why I was so disconnected, um, it just gave me a more purpose to like, okay, I need to find out what I am. I need to like, you know, see, you know, who I am. And, you know, it, I mean, in terms of belonging, I guess it didn't, I mean, I, at that point, I kind of already felt like I belonged. I felt I didn't feel like an outsider. I didn't feel like, um, you know, it just didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't already, I didn't feel that already. So it, so it, it, it just, it just strengthened my, it just made me not be so insecure to identify as indigenous and then gave me more of a power, like, like, and more of a reason why to identify as indigenous and um, to like, why it wasn't important to reclaim it because again, like it was, you know, taken from us. So I felt more, I, have, I had more urgency to reclaim it. Um, so yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Um, so with DNA, so tribal affiliation, it, I guess it's more, um, especially in like in I guess in the U.S., um, you I guess again the, the U.S. government, um, they I guess they they're like um, what do you say they're just they basically like, they track native like they're very they track Native Americans so they are um, like the government is heavily like like they're watching them and um, so I guess when the U.S. took their land and all these things, like they wanted to like have a record of who these, these people were. So they kind of um, tracked their like tribe and who they were. So, you know, now I guess the BAU, the um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, like they kind of created, they created all these like tribes and reservations everywhere. And so a tribal affiliation is more like you are, like you are, like you, are um, in the US, you are labeled as indigenous, like the government recognizes you as, as indigenous. And so that means, I mean, I don't I mean, the, a lot of tribes have like blood quantum to figure it out. You have like just, you know, it, it, it's in a way it's kind of like genocide too, because again, you could have like each tribe has their own like blood quantum. And let's say someone's full blood, but they have, but they're, but they're, from, they're from different tribes. But if so, if they don't, have enough blood quantum for one tribe or whatever tribe, two tribes, then they're like, then they don't, then they're, they're not considered like Native American, right? According to the government. So let's say bloodline, they could be full blood, but because they're not, they don't meet the blood quantum, then they're not indigenous. And um, so, yeah, so it's more like the government, the US government recognizes you as indigenous. Uh, a DNA is just more like, um, Okay, I know I'm 50% Native American, right? And and even like in Mexico, like you have indigenous communities, but they're not necessarily recognized, not recognized, but they're not like, I mean, they're not given a card, like, oh, like you are like Purepecha, so here's your card, right? And so they're, so they're not regulated like that in Mexico, but in the US, they're very regulated, very regulated. And a DNA test is just more like, it just kind of gives you like percentages of like what you are, um, as opposed to like, I mean, I mean, I didn't get, like I didn't get a you know a native a native card after my DNA, DNA test. I mean I could say oh hey I'm like I'm 45 percent you know like give me a card right but um, but I know who I am. I, like I know I look indigenous so it's not like there wasn't any confusion on that part. 
Absolutely. And uh, yeah, just, just to kind of wrap up, I wanted to share, like, it's interesting how, you know, watching YouTube videos about people opening the results and stuff. And one of the patterns I find, and obviously it doesn't surprise me, right? But people that they could be like, I don't know, 60, 70% native, but it shows like European, Italian, and they go like, they travel, right? They, they develop like an agenda, like, oh, I'm going to visit my my Italian, you know, heritage. And I think that's that's a reflection, right, of this obsession with whiteness and centralizing whiteness as as the epitome of, of uh, human experience, you know? But it's interesting though, because I think it really highlights like what, where our psyche is, how we view this. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, just to wrap up too, is that just to remind ourselves, you know, we, we are on our continent as brothers and sisters, as pan-indigenous people, we share this continent. We've been sharing this continent for thousands of years. And the way that I like to see it, and I offer people this, this, you know, this example is that 500 years of occupation and genocide is not going to erase thousands and thousands of years of being an indigenous people. And I think, you know, the, the fact that we're occupied on our land and they could be US, I could be talking about Mexico, I could be talking about uh, Central America, we're still not in full control and full power of who we are. And so I think establishing a clear connection to who we are as an indigenous people is part of a process, right? It's not, that's not the end of, of the journey, but I think I'm, I'm really excited to see so many young people, right? That are questioning this, that are breaking down these traditions of, of, of self-hate, of celebrating whiteness. And it's really exciting, you know, like you and I are in our thirties now and uh, ya estamos rucos. <laughs> but it's just really exciting to see um, so much, so many young people, right? And having these conversations with our families, I think it's so important. Like, how do we bridge that gap of 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 embracing our culture when generations ago they were taught to, you know, disclaim it, to to be embarrassed of it, to let go of it? And I think, in like in my particular case with. Um, with my family, you know, it's, it's been a very long journey, 23 years, but, um, I remember just talking to my aunts, right. Talking to my grandmother, who's, you know, who's gone into the universe, but not, and she told me like, we didn't get a chance to think about this. Like they didn't grow up with the privilege in those times to question and ponder, wow, who am I? Like, what race am I? Like, if you're coming from impoverished towns that are, you know, indigenous communities, this is not something that was speculated. It's not something that that was celebrating it in its totality because it was so oppressive. It was it's what brought upon you know economic hardships and and so much violence against our people, especially like in Mexico. Like I'm not gonna lie, like it happens, right? Those of us that are darker skinned, those of us that are closer connected to our indigenous communities, you know, based on the Mexican government, if they go missing they're not valued as much as someone that's lighter skin or an actual criollo from Mexico. And so when people think this is not just intellectual, this is not just talking about the fun part of decolonization, but the fact that this racism, this colorism, this hierarchy of ra of, ra of races in Mexico and all in other countries, it's detrimental to the well-being of our people. Like people are disappearing and they don't care about them because they're darker skinned Mexicans. People are killed like Ayot Ayotzinapa, the 43, Mujeres de Juarez. And it's like this normalized racism that that is accepted, right? And I think this is a beautiful opportunity and I wanted to um, share space with you and everyone that's joining us tonight. I appreciate your time. I know this has gone on. This is like, uh, what is it called? <laughs> Uh, extra hour, uh, extra hour here, but um, I'm very grateful for you, Gutiolo. You know, I think it's it's very, it takes a lot of um, courage to share your results, and it's very educational for us to see um, what what we can do, right, to trace ourselves and to heal from this trauma of colonization. And so, you know, any any last thoughts you want to share with our students from ED Colonize? before we go for tonight? Uh, yes, um, kind of going back on what you said about, you know, DNA 
DNA results that you've seen on video. And it's also beautiful to see um, people take a DNA, like Mexicans or even South Americans, and they come out to be 100%, you know, Native American, right? And they're like, yeah, that makes sense because I'm from Oaxaca and I'm Mixteco, we speak it. And like, and it's like, you know, it's, they're like 100%, like no, unidentified, like they don't even have, like their DNA is not even unidentified. Like it's all identified as this particular group. And it's kind of beautiful to see that as well. Because again, you hear this thing like, oh, well, we're all mixed and we're all mestizo. And it's like, no, there's a lot of us that are still, that are so full blood. And I think like this one girl, she was from Oaxaca and she said, she said, this inspires, this inspires me more to know, to keep my language, to pass it on and to like keep my tradition. Because again, she was like full native, like Oaxaca, like Mixteco. Miste, and, um, you know, and, and I, I had like a, I had a friend who, he told me he's like he's like I think my mom I thought I think my grandma's full blood like I'm gonna like I'm gonna get her a test so he got her a test and she was 100 percent you know Native American and you know so it's kind of beautiful to see like you know like there we are still they're still out there they're not all we're not all mixed and um, I know you I don't know if you talked about it but you you know found like the whole myth of mestizaje was you know it's not even it's not even true right but um but yeah I guess final thoughts would be just I don't know I guess. I mean, it's, gonna, it's, a, it's a journey, so be patient with yourself and, you know, ask questions, like, you know, ask all your family members, um, you know, yeah, ask questions, um, be patient, um, look at the resources, like the links that I get, like, uh, that I show, like family, family search, um, it's free. Um, so yeah, just kind of have fun with it, like kind of, you know, it, it is healing because you are like finding out like, who, yeah, it, we, like, like I said, it is a trauma. Um, or we have this historical trauma of our identity have been, you know, that's been destroyed. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it is healing. It is like, it is beautiful. It is, um, you know, it's, it gives you like confidence. It gives you like, yeah, this is who I am. Like I'm indigenous and, um, you know, like it's, we should be, I mean, we should be proud of it. Cause when you look, look at, his, look at the history, it's like a beautiful history. And yeah, so just, yeah, be patient, have fun, like just really, you know, explore. I mean, and again, I have to reiterate, you had to ask questions because my family did not care to, like, they did not, they did not care to know. They didn't want to ask. They didn't ask. So I was like, you know, I feel like now I'm like going to be like this gatekeeper of like family research because no one else is doing it. No one else cares. No one else. I mean, I tell my family and they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. But, but they're not doing like the work or they never, or they never ask. Like, you know, they're like my sisters had, you know, they have, my grandparents longer, but they never asked them anything. So I was like, you know, I was like, how do you not, like, how do you not ask people? But, um, but yeah, just, I feel like you have to ask people. Like, that's like, that's like the most important thing. And then you can kind of like verify it through like records or not. And it, it, even if you don't, at least you have like family, like oral history. But um, yeah, I mean, have fun and good luck. And now people were asking me like, oh, so how do I find my DNA? I'm like, well, look at, watch the video. <laughs> but um, <laughs> if you have any questions, like I'm, I'm online. Um, I think, are you going to put the links up for my Instagram or no? Yes. Yes. At the okay. end, once we go down, um, I'm going to, there's already some links to everything you mentioned. It's already in the video description, as well as the Google doc. If you can please fill out and do me a huge favor, you know, it's good to get to know you as students or need to colonize your questions, your concerns, um, and a follow-up, right? Uh, at the end of this 10 week course, I would love to do a zoom meeting with, all of you who have attended the majority of these courses and filled out a Google form. And I would love to have with Tiolo as part of it as well, just to be able to establish more of a community, um, a human connection, right? As, as we're in these times. Um, but with that, I wanted to uh, get into next week. I wanted to share this um, with everyone. Um, I'm very grateful for, for Brother Witsi Yola for joining me tonight. Um, like I said, you are going to have links to this video, but I also want to talk about next week. I have another very, very special guest. Uh, speaking of reviving and reclaiming and taking back who we are, we're going to have the class dedicated to an introduction to the Nahuatl language with uh, Brother Kuitlawak from um, speaknawa.com. He's gonna be joining us and giving us a class. So I'm super, super excited. And he's gonna talk about the importance of language revitalization, which is so important. It's happening globally, not just in indigenous communities of the Western hemisphere, but globally, we're taking our languages back. We're taking our identities back. 
and we're on our land. So there's so much powerful movements happening, so many interests, so many, you know, uh, attempts and approaches to decolonization. So with that, I'm going to leave you for tonight. Brother Wittiolo, again, Lasso Kamati, thank you for sharing space with us. I'm really excited uh, to continue our journey together decolonizing. And with everyone else, thank you so much. I know this was an extra long class, um, but I do appreciate you. Please share this work. It's really important for all of us to know this, for all of us to have these conversations. And with that, until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. And we will see you next Friday, uh, May 29th, 7 p.m. That one should be for about an hour. And with that, everyone have a beautiful, safe night and weekend. And we are out. Have a good night, everyone. Tlaso Kamati. Good night.